got that going now. So we'll give people a couple more minutes, uh, given the issue with the link. Thank you to everybody for being patient with us. And as people join, I'll, you'll probably hear me say this a couple of times. Everyone is joining the webinar muted um, as participants. However, um, you can raise your hand and I will unmute you as the meeting host. Um, you may also use the chat function to enter questions or comments. Um, as we go through the primary presentation uh, this morning, um, we will also pause at um, in, in key points so that we have um, some space to allow people to do that um, <clears throat> so that we can make sure that the discussion keeps going. Um, and if you have any questions before we get started, um, please raise your hand. Um, also, for those of you who are calling in to raise your hand, it is uh, star three. Okay, we want to get started, Jenna. One second. All right, you just let me know. That they don't see the chat. We have we had about fifty people, and we've got twenty five. Because of the link, we might have to wait until five after Darren. Sorry about okay, that. Okay, no problem. You just let me know. Oh, okay. So hopefully everyone now can see the chat. It's confirmed, Jenna. I can see it. Okay, thank you. Yes, now I see it. Um, we have a call in user with their hand raised. Do you have a question? No. Hi, this is <laughs> Penny. From Hi, Club Penny. Programs. I don't know if it's me that you're referring to, but. <laughs> um, okay, okay, so how do I put my hand down through the phone? <laughs> uh, I don't just, know. Press star oh, three. Okay. Press star three again. Press star three again, again and then okay. you can, yep again. There we go. That works. Okay, okay cool. Yeah. Remember that. <laughs> I'm I'm going to mute you just in case. I think it's star six for those on the phone also. Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started, Darren? Okay, good morning, uh, Aliso Creek Watershed Collaboration Group. Uh, this is Darren Haver from the University of California Cooperative Extension. It's been a while since we've been able to all get together, and so we're excited, even though this is still virtual, to uh, keep the conversation going. Hopefully soon we'll be able to meet uh, as a group in person uh, to continue this process. So this morning, uh, we're gonna start with the uh, next slide. We're going to start with some brief introductions um, and we're going to have to do the introductions through chat. So if you are able to put into the chat, we'd like to have your name in your organization. Should already have your name there, but it'd be good to put that in there so we can record it. If you're on the phone, that obviously will be a little bit difficult. Um, maybe uh, Jenna, you might have just addressed this and I missed it, but um, maybe they send you an email later um, if they called in so that you have their uh, name and title. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, the um, the Aliso Creek Collaboration Group organization team uh, consists of Jenna Voss from the Orange County Environmental Resources, Andrew McGuire from Orange County Environmental Resources, Avery Blackwell from Geosyntec Consultants, and Aaron Porosky from Geosyntec Consultants. So they've been helping uh, keeping these things uh, organized and moving along. We also have Dan Tran from Orange County IT to help us, and he's already been busy this morning. As you know, uh, even virtual after all this time, we, there's always technology issues that still occur. Uh, Jenna and Andrew will be monitoring any questions that you put in chat and we'll hopefully do a, a good job at uh, making sure that we notice those and we allow you to speak as we move through the presentations this morning. 
The next slide. So meeting objectives and role. This is just a summary of what we're going to try to cover today, and we're going to hopefully um, get through all of this. The first part is we're just going to go back and reorientate the group uh, that put all this work together, the purpose and the framework of the collaboration group. Then we'll move on to summarizing the Aliso Creek survey findings and then the development of the mini regional curve. And then we're going to provide an example of conceptual design projects resulting from the mini regional curve. And then hopefully we'll have time to present a roadmap for further conceptual design development, because that's the important part of what we came up with for this group is moving projects forward. And then introduce some potential opportunities for funding. I want to remind everybody of our, our normal participant roles. Um, that is to focus on the group objectives and moving forward. Try to listen with an open mind as much as possible. And then if you have an issue with something, make sure you uh, attack the problem and not an individual. Okay, let's next slide. Okay, so I'm going to just very quickly, and I'm going to probably condense this even more just so we can get back on track because we definitely want to make sure we have time to talk about the, the bulk of the project or meeting today, which is the mini regional survey. So the Aliso Creek Watership Collaboration Group formation it was initiated in May of 2018, and, and that initiation was um, supported by the South Orange County Watershed Management Area Integrated Regional Water Management Executive Committee. So it came about from because of previous planning efforts by the Army Corps engineers seemed to lack the local support and collaboration. And we were looking for ways that we could improve that and actually help move projects forward. So we leveraged input from a broad spectrum of stakeholders. And uh, next slide. And in that role, we hoped that we would create this collaboration framework. We spent a number of meetings uh, to flesh out how that would look. Um, we'll, return to those in a little bit. So just to refresh your memory on the desired outcomes that we came up with. But the idea is to create that framework. Project concepts can expand because of that framework. We come up with more collaborative agreements and coordinated projects. We are early on identifying any barriers and issues and resolving those. And then we hopefully will result in more projects being implemented overall. Next slide. So the collaborators have been a quite a large group, and I think that graphic says it all, where we had engineers, NGOs, biologists, cities, water districts, transportation aides. We had all kinds of people there. So the top group is the IWRM group, which provides our leadership and administration of the LISO framework. Uh, we provide information back to them on our progress. We've had cities, NGOs, county, water, and wastewater agencies, and that's their idea. Their purpose on that is to express local priorities and perspectives plan and implement projects of their own, and then hopefully communicate and collaborate with the other stakeholders in the group. And then I think another important concept, and we'll address this um, as we move forward into our next meetings, is the natural resource and mitigation agencies. Um, early on with them, uh, interact with them and provide insight on any mitigation needs, but also provide some kind of regulatory compliance perspective so that a project doesn't get too far down the line and find those things out later. Next slide. So the key input received so far uh, when everything was surveyed was that we the decision was made to continue meeting in a large group. Originally, the idea was maybe that we'd have these little smaller splinter groups that would tackle individual projects. But at this point, it's been decided to keep the large group format until we really start diving into these project based discussions and those need to kind of develop more organically. So we did a summary of the scientific studies and identify identify any data gaps that was at the last couple meetings. And those were um, some really nicely attended and uh, in interesting conversations that came out of that. And we also developed a framework uh, process that um, we'll review in a little bit uh, to document exactly how this process will work. So today's meeting uh, is, is to hopefully move forward on some of the project concepts from the lower reach of the watershed. So we have a project being brought forward that we'll use as a discussion point. And then I believe in the end of June, we'll be scheduling another meeting where we can actually talk about um, permitting options to streamline your project delivery. So those things still need to be done and those will be tackled in the next two meetings. I'm going to turn it over now to Jenna Voss, who will give us kind of the um, IRWM perspective on where we're at. Good morning. Thank you all for joining. We've got quite a few folks on today. Um, this it, I presented for those of you who were able to participate in the um, South Orange County uh, Watershed Management Area Executive Committee meeting earlier this month. Um, 
I uh, gave a brief presentation on this effort and talked about how the living project list and some of the other things that we have done really stem from and always will um, relate back to our primary IRWM plan goals. So there, the premise for the South OC group is the IRWM plan. That helps us meet compliance with the State Department of Water Resources requirements for an accepted region that qualifies us for funding. But above all of that, it also establishes what the stakeholders said were the primary um, goals for projects to be implemented within the region. And those are increased water supply reliability and efficiency, improve water quality, protect and enhance natural resources, and integrate flood management. So you'll see on the project map, when we did an initial um, dive into existing project lists and did a solicitation amongst the group, uh, we came up with 27 potential projects. Five were existing. Um, and we also had some really great conceptual projects come forward. Um, we looked at this in terms of what are potentially some of the reasons why some projects aren't moving forward. Are there, is there a need for funding, project partners, um, assistance with going through the regulatory permitting process. But we also filtered those all through those IRWM goals to make sure that what we're working on through this group also always harkens back to our primary um, goals. Next slide. As I'm sure all of you remember, we're not going to dwell on this. However, um, we have operating desired outcomes that will drive our conversation. Again, these always these really are kind of um, subcategories of those IRWM goals. They all relate back to that in some um, way, shape, or form. Um, several of these also are very similar to the strategies and measurable objectives in our IRWM plan. They are ecosystem is functional and resilient. Coastal uses are restored and preserved, balanced local water supply enhancement, supported infrastructure function, and improved public recreation and awareness. Next. So we also, as I mentioned through that, kind of dive into the projects that are already existing within uh, the watershed. We noticed that there were kind of rose to the top um, several categories of project types. Again, these are all kind of subdivisions of the way we look at projects for IRWM funding and other grant programs. Um, however, these this allowed us to get a little bit more specific in terms of the types of projects that could be looked at from a regional perspective um, and those that maybe need to be grouped or that could um, kind of initiate some of the discussion. Next. We also, as Darren mentioned, we worked uh, to put together what we're calling the reference guide that is still available on our website at southocirwm.org. Um, the reference guide was the result of that comprehensive presentation of data that we, we collected from a lot of different sources from um, agencies and other groups working within the watershed. Uh, the purpose was to provide kind of a, a living reference tool for um, organizations and agencies working on projects within the watershed. So um, we wanted to make sure that this is a useful tool to everybody. Um, we've made it available on the website. We want to make sure that the key content, IRWM context, collaboration tools, state of the science, project definition and permitting options, um, all of that is included uh, to be um, a well-rounded and comprehensive document for as a reference. We are also working to make that more of a living uh, tool through our website, so stay tuned for more to come. We will talk about this. Uh, we'll kind of wrap this up at the next meeting very briefly. Next slide. All right, I think this is where I hand it off. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jenna. Okay, we're gonna move on to the mini regional curve uh, portion of this uh, um, meeting this morning. So I have plenty of time for prompts and questions when we move through this presentation, but I'm gonna initiate and the presentation by turning it over to Jennifer Shook. Thank you, Darren. Good morning. I just wanted to take a minute real quick to introduce our next speakers and provide some context for their presentation. If you don't know me, I'm, I manage our OC Public Works Mitigation Program. And like many others in this group, I'm really keen to see what the full restoration potential for Aliso Creek is. I met George Kelly with Bespoke Mitigation Partners a few years ago at a national mitigation conference. 
George has over 30 years of experience in the field of performance-based environmental restoration and has worked with numerous resource agencies, landowners, investors, um, and private and public credit buyers in the implementation and mitigation projects. George and Earl also introduced me to Dave Vitalspech with Five Smooth Stones, who um, is a design engineer with over 20 years of stream restoration experience. George and Dave have both been involved in the implementation of large scale restoration projects um, throughout the nation. So because of that, I thought it'd be helpful to bring them in as a third party to have them look at Aliso Creek and see what could be possible um, for design options. And um, as part of their assessment, they did look at the core plan. They looked at the locally preferred plan as well as our desired outcomes to take that into consideration so they know what was important to the stakeholders. Their assessment is limited in scope, so as you watch the presentation, just keep that in mind, but I am hoping that it can help move this conversation forward to see what kind of opportunities exist for some projects along the lower six miles of Aliso Creek. So at this time, I'll turn the presentation over to George Kelly and Dave Vitalspatch so they can talk about their conceptual design and some of the foundational data that they've collected and developed for their concept design. Thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot, Jennifer, and, uh, and uh, I want to thank uh, Jenna and the Geosyntec team as well. Uh, great to be here today, particularly after a long pandemic. Um, just to kind of uh, give you a little bit more table setting before I turn it over to Dave Vital, Vital back, because Five Smooth Stones did most of the technical review that you're going to see in this presentation. Um, but as Jennifer mentioned, um, I've been involved with delivering performance-based solutions in the ecological and water resource realm for some 30 years. And in that context, we've done about uh, 52,000 acres of wetland restoration, but also over 300 miles of stream. Um, and I think one of the key uh, elements we want to leave you with in this, in this uh, discussion is that the design really does follow um, your goals and your, and your desired outcome and also your funding sources. And sometimes uh, they may be limited, sometimes they may be broader. We know you're here in the context of the IRWM, and we know that we're looking for a lot of multiple benefits. Um, and I think though, uh, it's very uh, important to understand though, from our perspective, when you look at these design issues, if we're looking at mitigation, it may be different from flood reduction, which may be different from a fisheries approach, which may be different uh, from a groundwater enhancement scenario or a water quality approach. So um, you can, the, the design for now is, you know, a more generic approach to make sure that, you know, we have covered your uh, outcome desires, but, um, you know, I think that that still is a, a work in progress. Before I turn it over to Dave to really get into the heart of this, I do want to highlight one point. You're going to hear something called a multi, multiple criteria decision analysis and MCDA. Um, we've used it in the context of a very narrow context of looking at what are the alternatives for stream restoration? How do you look at and evaluate your options under the alternatives approach? But I think this MCDA tool is also a great tool for a broader context, looking at your living project list to be able to prioritize based on weighted averages uh, for your desired outcomes. And so I only mentioned we're using it in a very narrow context today. It could be uh, broadened in, in, a, in a much broader sense. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dave Vitals back at Five Smooth Stones and he can give you a, a broader introduction and move into the uh, PowerPoint. All right, thank you, George. Uh, so. The outline of what we'll be presenting on today will be trying to give you a brief purpose as we saw it uh, in our assessment. Uh, a little bit of introduction to the team, which you've already had, a uh, background uh, of why we thought looking at this in a different light to what had historically been an analyzed and assessed might be important. Uh, we'll share with you kind of field work survey methodology. Uh, what a regional curve is, uh, its application for this type of ecosystem restoration, priority levels for restoration, which are basic concepts of what we what could be done, uh, not so much what would be done, but what could be done. And then, as George talked about, the MCDA or multi-criterial decisional analysis tool. Then we'll talk about 
uh, some example natural channel designs and geomorphic designs of stream and wetland restoration. And then we'll conclude it with next steps and uh, just questions. So as, as you come up, feel free to type something in the chat. I have the chat, chat open. If I see something come up, I'll try to incorporate it into my thoughts. Um, the pur purpose as we saw it was really to come in here as a third party, somebody that hasn't been overly involved in the process and provide another alternative to the Army Corps of Engineers design plan, as well as the local preferred plan. And try to look at the benefits of each of those plans and see if there's a, a way that we could come up with something that kind of um, meshed with the local preferred plan more while still achieving the risk reduction goals that something like the Army Corps of Engineers plan was really desiring. So we tried to understand uh, stakeholder groups to desires and outcomes from different documents that were recorded. I'm sure we didn't completely understand them. I'm sure there's going to be some stuff that was missed in communication, uh, but this is really to serve as the starting point for another alternative um, if it's desired by, by the group. Next slide. So, introduction of our Introduction of our team as George uh, Kelly has said before, uh, we've just done a number of projects throughout the US and we've worked together for about 15 plus years on various projects. So just bring a different way of looking at uh, the restoration of Aliso Creek to the table than what some other people may have looked at. Uh, so everybody on the line is probably pretty familiar with Aliso Creek, but essentially, Essentially, it just extends from the Cleveland National Forest to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, it has uh, a drainage area about 34.6 square miles. So when when you're looking at the regional curves, you're looking at about that 35 square mile, and you'll see that on the x-axis, and that will give you an idea of uh, how big the channel is. Has anybody else's? Uh, let's see. Just move forward, um, and then we also. We're allowed uh, the benefit of looking at the financial and habitat considerations derived from the Tetra Tech Army Corps of Engineers analysis. So we could look at the channel width, the areas of disturbance, the haul distances, and uh, material transport, and get an idea of what would this long-term impact be, and the cost, uh, and both the cost and ecological impacts. So those were kind of the backgrounds that we looked at, and the easy question was, can we do something that's an ecological restoration that doesn't have as much of a temporary impact and can utilize more vegetation uh, for stability opposed to rock and armored material that would be trucked in? Next slide. So the background of uh, the Corps of Engineers design, they had four different primary design techniques, and we actually use some of the same concepts for looking at different alternatives. Their first alternative was to do nothing. Their second one to stabilize a stream bed and create a new floodplain. Uh, third one was to raise a stream bed and connect it to a historic floodplain. And then the fourth one was to raise a stream bed and create a floodplain within the channel. So for priority uh, two and priority three restoration, they had a certain defined uh, channel from Army Corps of Engineers alternatives and it had a base width of about 76 feet for the bottom of the channel. And then where the queue or the two year discharge would show up in the channel, it had about a hundred foot wide channel. Um, when George had approached me with this, uh, our first thought was, and George's first thought was that, that seemed like a very large channel for this system, being 35 square mile drainage area. The question was, did we have to um, make a channel that was that big, or could we get away with a slightly smaller channel that would have less of an impact? So what we looked at as the next phase of this was really to look at some really rough hydraulic geometry relationships uh, in the area. And there's been hydraulic geometry relationships that will take a drainage area in a region and will predict how big the channel 
form and discharge or how big the primary channel needs to be before you get to a floodplain uh, based on that drainage area. And this is something that's been worked on since the late 60s. Um, and uh, the, the son of Alda Leopold, uh, Luna Leopold had put together a regional curve here uh, in California back in uh, the late 70s. And then there's been a lot of curves done in this region since then. And one of the things that we noticed uh, through a series of investigations before we did any work is that it seemed as this this 100 foot wide channel was significantly larger than what it would need to be for a stable stream design. So that was that's why we originally said, hey, we're going to come out here and try to understand how big this channel needs to be. And then we can design, then we can look at the size of that channel, look at what the stream design could look like, look at the areas that would be impacted and the temporary disturbance as long as long-term disturbance from that. So when we talk about a channel form and flow, uh, there's three terms that are used in conjunction and we could spend a lot more time talking about this. People have classes in the university setting that discuss the merits of each one of these, but essentially uh, we talk about a channel form and flow and there's three uh, ways and documentations where this has been discussed. One is a dominant discharge an effective discharge and a bankful discharge. Um, for the simplification of this presentation, we will discuss the channel form and discharge as a bankful discharge. Um, and if somebody really wants to uh, get into a lot more detail related to this later. Uh, I'd be happy to uh, schedule a time to discuss it with you and say why that assumption might be correct. Um, and then we also want to look at what the bank erosion in this ur in these urban channels were. So see how much material is going to be supplied to the stream from bank erosion, and that bank erosion is that going to have a negative impact as it's eroded into the stream, or will there be a potential positive impact? Let's move to the next slide. The next slide talks kind of about the project design flow. Um, and uh, we'll talk, we did, originally looked at the regional curve analysis. Then we said, okay, well, it seems like there must be a slightly smaller channel that could be designed out here. So we developed field work and a survey methodology to go out to the field and collect a ser series of about 30 cross sections. And from those 30 cross sections, at different points in the drainage basin, we were able to establish a mini regional curve. From that mini regional curve, we were able to look at goals and objectives of stakeholders as we understood them uh, with the gaps of us being bright and late and apply priority levels for restoration, which is real basic ideas of how you could restore a stream. Um, a lot of times these priority levels have a mixture of priority levels in the actual stream restoration opposed to just one priority level for the whole reach. A lot of times it's a, a mixture of different priority levels, but this allows us to apply these priority levels to say, this is what restoration could look like with this size channel. And then we can start to look at the goals and objectives in more detail to each design alternative and say, okay, well, which one meets uh, the most amount of the goals and objectives that we have for the project, which one optimizes this? And then we, after we know which one's optimal, we can evaluate uh, alternatives based on cost and reach. So. Let's go to the next slide here, and we'll talk about the field work and survey methodology. Uh, so on the next slide, as we continue on, our field work, um, we really want to talk about the feasibility of reconnecting the stream bed to any kind of historical floodplain. Some of these historical floodplains are high enough up that there's now schools developed build on them, there's roadways on there, and we couldn't reconnect to some of the historical floodplains. But there's lower historical floodplains that have been departed from uh, that could be reconnected to. So we wanna look at the feasibility of reconnecting to different historical floodplains. And the idea of connecting to floodplain is that as there are flood flows, energy can dissipate, it can spread out. It doesn't create as much destruction uh, to the channel when the water depth does not increase that high. Uh, so it's an idea of spreading out and dissipating energy onto the floodplain. We will want to look at reducing sediment deposits in streams, ponds, wetlands, and lakes. We also wanted to understand channel dimension 
assist in assessment planning process. And uh, we wanted to have a benchmark for kind of what natural channel design could look like in this area. And the concept of natural channel design is simply saying, based on the water and the sediment being supplied to the reach, we want to design a stream that will get stronger in time based on the growth of vegetation. Uh, and it will be able to transport the water and sediment being supplied to the reach without aggrading. Uh, so basically filling in, clogging in the channel or degrading, which is eroding and causing potential infrastructure concerns, uh, but it will be able to move the water and sediment being supplied. And then we wanted to develop a regional rate, a mini regional curve, which would help us evaluate restoration options and cost. The size of the channel is significant in the cost of a construction project, as well as the impact environmentally, both short term and long term of a restoration project to the system. Next slide. So what our field work looked like was we use the same reaches, which was a series of 13 reaches and some sub reaches within those 13 reaches as defined by Tetra Tech and the Army Corps of Engineers documentation. We didn't want to confuse the subject by creating new reaches, and we felt like the detail they had was close enough to what we would have decided in the field by creating our own reaches that we did not feel a need to uh, create a whole lot of additional work by creating new reaches. So we wanted to keep the same reach uh, notation as before. So with this, uh, in each one of these reaches, we tried to find typical cross sections that we could survey. Uh, the cross section and site selection was based on the reach breaks but and aerial photography. So if we looked at aerial photography, I'd say, okay, it looks like we have decent access here. It looks like it's gonna be a tangent section of the creek. Uh, we generally survey on tangent sections of the creek uh, where we have deposition that will occur at high flow and at low flow, we see a little bit of uh, faster water and we see a flow re reversal over these tangent sections. So these are the riffle sections of the river, and that's where we try to that's where we try to focus our geomorphic assessment uh, and cross section survey to. Not that the pools aren't important, but they're formed by uh, higher degrees of freedom related to how tight a bend curve is, uh, the spacing of material uh, convergence scour on the floodplain. So there's other reasons why a pool will form that don't make it as good as a representation for channel size and dimension. And we wanted to know where there's open access to GPS survey so we could look at aerial photography and say, hey, it looks like there's gonna be enough space in between the leaves that we can survey here with the survey grade GPS. And we're not gonna have to use different equipment that would cost more money to do and the entire survey was done uh, on foot or so uh, on foot without a motorized vehicle uh, with the use of bikes to get from one location to another location. So we wanted to make sure that we had access uh, that we could get to these reaches uh, without having to um, hike really far and leave gear and equipment behind. Next slide. So with the next slide, when we talked about the field work, um, we went out and we surveyed with server grade GPS. You can see in the shadow, I happened to take a picture of the, the only picture I had was uh, sh a picture of the stream where you could see the shadow of me surveying. Uh, but uh, we went across and just surveyed um, a lot of data on the cross sections, and then we compared it to LIDAR data that was available for the region. What we see for LIDAR data is that it's really good data and it will do fine for modeling, uh, but it does not allow us to see the detail of where vegetation starts, ends, the changes in vegetation, changes in sedimentation and erosion that's needed to look at channel form and flows. Uh, next slide. So when we were out on in this field, uh, the next slide will show a example cross sections that were surveyed and we identified what was called the bank full indicator. And this is an indicator of where the channel form and discharge is. This is essentially if you wanted to know how big the channel was before there was a floodplain, 
uh, this is how big the channel is based on the drainage area and the sediment being supplied to there. Uh, so the drainage area was calculated above each cross section. And then on the cross section, we had a series of bankful calls that seemed higher than bankful. This might be because it was a scour line where material has fallen into the creek or a change in upland vegetation. And we also had a series of calls that were lower than bankful may have been a depositional bar where we had a aquatic vegetation grown on uh, or it could be something where we just had a change in depositional patterns uh, formation of a uh, mid-channel bar that hadn't yet become an island so we looked at a range of bankful features that were both higher and lower than what we thought the bankful call would be and this gives us a high degree of uncertainty of the bankful call so um, we also stayed away from existing structures, including bridges and culverts whenever possible. So if we uh, saw a bridge or culvert, we knew that that bridge and culvert can change the hydraulics. And if the stream was stable, if it had depositional features, uh, if it had scour features, uh, that may be affected by the flow lines going through the bridge and culvert more than the stability of a free flow and riffle section and that's what we're really, really looking for these sections that are being formed by the flow and the sediment being supplied by the watershed and not by external influences next slide so we're going to move on to the regional curve application in the next slide now do we have any questions for that first portion i don't see anything in the chat just double checking i was going to I'm just going to um, jump in here. Oh, go one ahead. second, Aaron. So um, we, for some reason, the chat is only available for folks to send chat to the presenters. Um, so I am going to copy and paste and um, put into the chat for everyone. Um, Andy is also going to add all of the attendees as part of the chat. Um, so people can see who is um, participating today. Um, so just give me a, uh, uh, bear with us one second while I put the questions in the chat. Um, let me look through here real quick. So, um, Mike Beenan asked, does uh, five smooth stones have experience with watersheds discharging to marine protected areas and, fat, um, and popular family beaches like Aliso Beach and ocean subject to summer, summer urban runoff discharges? Yeah, we... We worked with uh, uh, sites in Wilmington, North Carolina, um, and there's a lot of ideas of urbanization related to beach access as well. Um, we've also worked on uh, other beach locations in uh, Oregon and Washington as well, and uh, we've worked in Oakland, California. So we have some experience. Every every site is different, um, and just because we had some experience doesn't mean that we have a great understanding of exactly what's going to be needed for this project without stakeholder communication and um, understanding things that we wouldn't know by coming in from out of, out of state. Okay, thank you. We also have a Q&A. Um, so the questions will come to us and as they're answered, um, we can assign them or we can, um, if they're answered verbally, I can include that in the Q&A. Christine Medek asks, if open access for GPS is required for collecting Channel cross sections. Does this bias the data towards areas with higher erosion? Less vegetation equals uh, more subject to erosion equals more open access. Yeah, and that's true. There'll, there'd be a slight bias towards areas that have a uh, little bit higher potential for erosion. Uh, we would not choose any cross sections that uh, were actively. Um, in a high degree of instability. Uh, we'll take sites that are in a quasi degree of equilibrium, but not a high degree of equilibrium. And where we just have such dense um, vegetation cover, uh, we could not have surveyed in those locations. Now, our survey was done in December, uh, so we were able to get some pretty dense mm -hmm. uh, canopy cover that we were able to survey underneath just because it's a little bit more open in December than it is in other months. Uh, but it's it's still 
uh, we still do have a slight bias towards areas that are uh, more wide open or lower vegetation that we can put the rod above. So that's correct. There's a little bit of a bias towards that. Okay, Steve Deshawn asks, has anyone investigated what the upper reach work is going to do to the flows in the lower reaches? Um, in parentheses, reach three and four. We're not at the point where we're investigating that at this time. All we're looking at is things related to phasing and construction. Uh, so the idea is, well, if we're gonna have work being done in the upper reaches, how do we phase that so that we don't fill in what's being done in the downstream reaches, as well as what are some temporary uh, sediment control measures that could be done uh, to be able to limit the uh, temporal impacts of this work. Uh, but we're not quite far enough along to look at a real detailed analysis of staging uh, and construction, and we don't really understand where the funding would come from for all these different reaches yet. So we don't know if we'd start in reach 13 or start in reach three at this point. And and I'm, I'll just chime in real quickly and say that yeah. Dave, I'll, I'm gonna ask you a question probably later about the role of watershed flow controls on the channel design. And so, if, you know, that, that may also be related to, um, to, to the question pose. And we can come back to that when you present the, the design concept. Okay, we have um, another question here from Charles Busslinger. Can you provide some background on the technical team's experience with Southwestern US Streamflow projects? Yes, if, um, in the Southwestern US, uh, we've done a fair amount of work in Arizona. Uh, we've done some work in Nevada and Reno, uh, as well as Carson City, um, and then my work is out of Colorado, so we do a lot of work in New Mexico as well. So when it comes to, uh, you know, kind of semi-arid environments, uh, that's um, an area that we work in fairly often. I don't know the exact detail of what Charles wants related to uh, uh, a background, but we have some background related to um, work in, in streams that are similar to this. As I said before, all streams are different. I've never been on two projects that I said, well, just like that project, I always find out something new in each project we work on. Okay, we have um, one more question from Charles. Can you provide some background on the technical, oh, sorry. Um, hasn't the lower uh, reaches of the watershed already been surveyed multiple times? What is the reason the past surveys need re-evaluation? I can answer from my standpoint, uh, and then uh, somebody else might want to answer beyond that. Uh, our survey field effort was a very rapid survey field effort. Effort we were able to get all 31 cross sections surveyed in a two to three day period, and in that two to three day period, we wanted to have enough detailed understanding of where the bankful calls were, where the change in vegetation, change in deposition, change in scour was. Uh, in that reach that the existing data sets that were surveyed down there just didn't look at uh, the stream function from the same way that we were looking at it. So we considered a pretty minimal cost to go down and get additional cross sections uh, when we knew that we'd have to go down and look at where bankful calls were anyways. Uh, from my standpoint, the 30 cross sections, uh, I would have spent three quarters of the time just going to those 30 cross sections and trying to understand where the bank full stage was, where the deposition scour was. Uh, and the time of taking the crop on there doesn't take that long once you're actually at that location. Uh, we do a auto topo on the cross sections and we only do one or two cross sections on each site. So they generally take us on the order of magnitude of 10 minutes of cross section and that's it. Once we're there, it takes us a lot longer to get to the cross section than it does to survey it. And so I think what you're saying, Dave, is that you're, you're down there, you're looking for some different things than what the past geomorphic surveys would have been looking for. And that's pretty inherent to the sort of difference in your design approach. So may, maybe you can spend just a, a minute elaborating a little bit on the, the difference in what you're looking for compared to what might have been the design basis for the Army Corps' work. 
um, supporting yeah. their design. Yeah, the Army Corps of Engineers works off of, uh, and I'd, I'd hate to get in the weeds, but hopefully it's helpful to Charles or some other people. Army Corps of Engineers works off of something called an effective discharge. An effective discharge is calculated by looking at a range of predicted uh, flows over a stream location, and you will synthesize a flow duration curve uh, for each section of the stream. As that's synthesized, you also have to calculate a sediment loading curve uh, for that. And sediment loading curves is kind of a voodoo science, if you will, and it's what I've had a lot of my research in. But we can calculate how, how much sediment gets moved through a cross section, but how much sediment gets supplied to cross section is very questionable, and that's a lot harder to quantify. So when it comes to looking at a effective discharge it's related to your sediment supply rate and your water being delivered and you multiply them together to get the most amount of sediment that's moved over time so a lot of times that based on your assumptions of how much sediment supplies in the reach uh, and how quickly it moves through a site that changes how big your channel needs to be and that changes the features that you're looking at when you're doing a geomorphic assessment because you're going to be looking at higher features uh, related to what you think that channel needs to be moving. For the way that we look at it, we start from the smaller features and work our way out. So we look at a feature that is generally not considered in most geomorphic assessments by the Corps of Engineers. A guy named Oster Camp years ago talked about an inner berm feature, which is this regional storm, uh, small storm type feature that grows and supports vegetation that's significantly smaller than the channel form and discharge. But then we have a series of small channels within bigger channels. So we just look at a lot smaller channels to get started than what uh, traditional geomorphic assessment would look at from the Army Corps of Engineers methodology. Um, yeah, and that, so that's that's it, helpful. It, that's it's just helpful a different way of looking at it. Yeah. Th thanks for thanks for going into that a little bit. And I, I I'm 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 cool if you want to move on. Yeah. Let's go ahead and move on to the to the next portion of your presentation, Dan. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about regional curve application, uh, and we can go to the next slide here. Uh, the purpose of a regional curve is really to establish how big a channel needs to be. Once we know how big a channel needs to be, then we can start to say, okay, well, what does that, how does that look on plan form? How does that look in profile? How can we incorporate that into the landscape? But until we know kind of that dimension uh, or how big the channel needs to be, uh, it's hard to incorporate. It's like making a pipe network. Uh, you can lay out the pipes in your house, but if you don't know if it's going to be a four inch uh, pipe or if it's going to be a one inch pipe, that's going to change where you can take the pipe through. So, let's go to the next slide. Next slide. Uh, this is just a rough idea of what we looked at on each cross section. Uh, we looked at the regional curve, the relationship between the bankful channel and the drainage area. And generally, we're trying to understand that in the same physiographic region. So we don't want to have a big change in how water gets to a basin, how fast, how flashy it is. Uh, we don't want to have a big change in what resists flow in the basin, the type of vegetation, also the type of substrate that resists flow. Um, and we realize that there's a lot of these regional curves that are still developed, and they had been developed over years and years. So we wanted to create a mini regional curve that was really focused just on this watershed and looked at bankful features in this watershed and try to compare that back to data that had already been published through regional curves. Um, so if you look at the picture here, you can see that uh, the big thing that jumps out is that the low flow uh, width of this channel is on the order of magnitude on the base width of it is about five to 10 foot. And the Army Corps of Engineers uh, design had called for a 76 foot wide channel. So as soon as we jump down into Elysio Creek, uh, what seemed to be obvious from the aerial photography became very obvious as we saw this small low flow channel uh, that was supporting vegetation and different terraces of flows. And you can see in the cross section uh, next to the picture where we have these different breaks and terraces that go up to there. We don't just have one defined channel, we have a series of defined channels inside of there that are nested inside other channels. So if we go to the next, if we go to the next uh, um, slide, this is 
the data that we had collected for our mini regional curve. Each one of these points, there's 31 points on here, uh, and there, of those 31 points, uh, each point, most most points have a low and a high bankful call. So you look at the gray points, and they're the points that we thought were higher than bankful. We looked at the lower points; they're the points that were lower than bankful. So it shows you there's a range of variation, and natural streams have a range of variability. It's not like every stream is going to be the exact same dimension. Um, and we also have instabilities. We have some places that have higher sediment supply rates, other places that have lower sediment supply rates, some places that have a lot of vegetation, other places that have been armored and now are at quasi-equilibrium. So that variability is really important in the design um, of a channel, but it's also important that we don't design a channel that's just bigger than any of these bankful calls that we're seeing. Uh, so we have a tool that we've been using internationally for about 15 years now that looks at a prediction of a curve based on rainfall totals uh, almost independently. Uh, so we look at rainfall totals in an area and we say, this is where we think a curve could start at. And this allows us to go in the second and third world countries and be able to evaluate how big a channel needs to be to do basic water resource work before we actually even have to go to the ground and conduct any data where travel is very difficult to get to. Uh, so we did the same thing here in California right before we started, and we showed a relationship that when we surveyed, everything was slightly higher than our rainfall prediction, but not that much off of our rainfall prediction. Uh, and we did have two distinct different uh, features in a in a higher terrace and a lower terrace related to bankful calls. Let's go to the next slide. And we'll show how this compared to other published regional curves. And this is just a snapshot of some of the other published regional curves. If I really wanted to take time and look, I could probably find two or three times this many regional curves uh, that have been published through some sort of documentation in uh, California region. Most of these are peer reviewed publications opposed to just publication through a uh, permit document or, or such. So what you'll show here is that the data that we collected seemed to fall in line pretty well with uh, other data that had been collected before. And this was something that we weren't surprised about. Uh, we actually kind of thought that it might, but the Army Corps of Engineers channel design was so much larger uh, than any of these regional curves that we wanted to make sure that we had the data from field collected data to verify that it actually should fall close to these curves. And you can see that it doesn't fit all these curves in all the locations. So which curve you choose is always a question as well. And there's justification why you say, well, I choose this curve opposed to this curve. Um, but that justification is never as good as collecting data in the field. So that's that was the purpose of trying to collect the 31 cross sections is to create our own mini regional curve and then compare it back. Let's move on to the uh, uh, next slide. And uh, so from the next slide, we're gonna be talking about how we can apply this regional curve. So now we have a regional curve that will tell us at any drainage area about how big the bankful cross-sectional area should be of the channel. David, we're gonna take a Is little there, pause here just to make sure we don't have any uh, questions, outstanding questions from that last sounds section. Good. Uh, Jenna? Uh, yep, we have, we have um, a question from Christine Medic. Can we receive the regional curve references used? Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, um, I'd, I'd be more than happy to kind of put them into a PDF and check the publication and share and uh, the uh, copyright on each one of them and then distribute them if appropriate. Um, these, most of these, if you Google them, you could find them. Uh, some of them, you might, might need a copyright to be able to share them with somebody, but we can look into that and share them. Uh, they all are all fairly available for what we've listed on this on the slide. Thank you, David. Any, any others, Jenna? That it? I, if anyone would like to speak, just as a reminder, you can raise your hand. Um, 
we uh, the Q and A. As soon as these um, questions are answered, I am making them um, public. So any questions we've received have been posted in the chat or are in the Q and A, which is still an option. However, you are also free to raise your hand, and we will unmute you. And um, we'd love to hear from someone. Okay. Okay. I I don't see any. Don't see anyone. Okay. All right. Then I think we'll go. Oh, do I see something from Mike? Uh, yep, let me see here. Uh, from Mike Beenan, um, the data curves rely on recent conditions versus pre development in the 1960s. That, yeah, that's definitely, that's definitely a true fact, Mike. Um, in the 1960s, we probably would have expected a slightly smaller channel, uh, natural channel to be formed in through there, in through this area before you had a lot of development. And now, post uh, development and with the changes of flows and what flows have gone to the creek and how stormwater is managed, these this recent mini regional curve really is related to the conditions in the creek uh, today, opposed to the conditions of a pristine natural area. But your your underlying working hypothesis here, Dave, is that there are segments of the creek that are reasonably stable, and that you can use those as your guiding reference for how to create and improve stability, improve habitat in other segments of the creek that may not be as as stable currently. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, that that's accurate. What we look at is we look for reaches that are what we call quasi equilibrium. Uh, so it's not it doesn't mean that they're stable reference quality, but it means that they're stable enough that they are moving the sediment that's coming into the site and not a grading or degrading. Um, and they may have a little bit higher bank erosion rates than we want, but they're still not a grading or degrading in bed form. So mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean stable. We, we use the term quasi stable. Yeah, uh, sure. quasi equilibrium Ge yeah, instead. Ge geomorphically stable, which is not truly stable <laughs> and you don't want it to be truly stable because stable means uh, dead <laughs> in a lot of ways. Um, yeah. And I think yeah, that's an important we, point. We definitely don't want, we don't definitely don't want a static site. Uh, static site is what army Corps of engineers was really providing to the group to in their alternative, something that was going to be static, going to be in place, going to limit risk. And our, our thought is, well, we want something that's going to grow stronger in time and allow a movement of the channel to occur uh, where it's acceptable, opposed to just not allow any movement of the channel to occur. Right. We have yeah. one more question as a follow-up from Mike. So, quote, natural is based upon altered conditions. Uh, I think natural I, I... can be based on altered conditions at times, sure. Um, what... What we call natural, um, we want the natural processes uh, to be able to function within this restoration uh, scheme. So that means that we have to have these altered conditions of flow uh, because that's what's there right now, and we want something that's going to grow stronger with those altered conditions. So that is that is a true statement, Mike. Yeah, I think this when goes back to talk the about desire. I think this kind of ties back to the desired outcomes that we talked about in the early part of this work group, which is the, the, the notion of a functional and resilient ecosystem, as opposed to a pristine and, and you know, pre-development, pre-European referenced ecosystem. And, and I think we have, you know, should recognize very much that, that Dave's approach here is based on, on trying to create something functional and resilient within the current, or within a, maybe a slightly improved, but not a, you know, not a pre European flow regime, um, you know, as, which, which would be really fairly infeasible. Um, so I just want to we, signpost that. We do have a question, another question from Ray Heimstra. What is the time estimate to complete the work presented today? And I think, Ray, if it's all right, we'll hold that until we get to the end of the presentation where we talk about next steps. Okay, and I think I see one more here. 
So Mike, as a follow-up, a goal has been to restore the native flows to control pollution at the beach. I think that's a great goal. I think that the natural channel design alternatives that we're looking at uh, would benefit from that goal as well. So I think native flows are always going to be beneficial for native vegetation um, and wherever feasible, that's a great goal to have. Okay, great. that's all should... the questions I see. Thank you. Great, thanks, Jenna. We should move on. Go ahead, David, to your next section on priority levels for restoration. Good. So the priority levels for restoration, we're going to move on to the next slide. And we talk about four priority levels, and these are the same priority levels that were discussed with different numbering, but the same priority levels that were discussed by uh, Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, the priority level that we use, we've changed the number of them a little bit based on a standard reference uh, that was created in 1997 by a researcher named Dave Rosgen and then, and then republished by Barbara Dahl uh, at all at North Carolina State University in 2003. Uh, the first priority level is reconnecting to an old historic floodplain, so raising up a channel, but the next one is constructing a new channel within the old channel. Third one is excavating kind of benches it's for stability uh, in places and creating small discontinuous floodplains. And the final one is just armoring a stream bank without creating any new floodplain. So all four of these restorations um, levels are related to restoring an incised channel. An incised channel just means that it's cut down away from the historic floodplain. So they're all related to the floodplain restoration as well as the channel restoration. We can go to the next slide. We have a graphic of what that looks like for a priority one, priority two, and priority three restoration. And this is just from a federal document. So they look kind of silly in the old clip art uh, from Windows 98. But um, priority one restoration is you have a deeply incised old channel, and that's what we see uh, right now on most of the sections of Aliso Creek is this channel that's cut down pretty far from where the old historic floodplain is. And they'll fill in the old channel with however much material they can find. They can leave ponds and wetlands for where they don't have enough material to fill in. And then they create a small channel that more frequently accesses that high flood floodplain surface. Um, and that's a real valuable restoration concept um, that's used on a lot of sites and we've we really we really like doing that on many sites but it's can be pretty negative when you have a lot of urban development in an area so this is something where we could think about this on the lower reaches but we really don't want to think too much about this uh, in the midst of uh, the development on the upstream reaches um, a priority two restoration is where we take areas that may be natural area and you just lower them to create a floodplain at a lower elevation. So we create this bankful channel and then we do a series of, of uh, uh, floodplain benches. This is a real beneficial idea in urban environments where you need to lower flood stage as well because you can take out trees, you can replant trees and you're creating uh, more flood conveyance uh, in a system as well. So uh, that's, the concept of a priority two restoration. The priority three restoration is places where you have heavy infrastructure that's going to limit how much of a floodplain you can create at a lower elevation, and you still need to kind of keep the creek at that lower elevation. So you're creating these disconnect continuous bankful benches or floodplain benches along the channel. And then a priority four restoration is probably the restoration that most people think of. Uh, when they're talking about, hey, we need to stabilize this incised stream, and a lot of times people don't think of it as being an incised stream. They just say we need to stabilize this creek or gully, and they just throw rock on it, and that's what we call a priority for restoration. So uh, that's those are concepts of restoration. I'm just waiting to make sure there's no questions before we move on. So um, from the Army Corps of Engineers uh, analysis of this. Uh, their trapezoidal uh, channel design, they had uh, kind of a two-stage trapezoidal channel design. And what they were looking at was kind of what we would call a priority two restoration in our conclusions. And it's not a 
it's not a bad idea. It's actually good because it gets flood flows moving. But the real question is how much room do you need for this type of priority to restoration opposed to uh, can you narrow the room so you're not disturbing as much of the ecosystem around the channel? So there's also some other potential alternatives that we looked into uh, on the reach, things like beaver dam analog systems, the stage zero channel design, where we basically don't even create a real defined main channel. We just fill in the old channel. Uh, and these are all these are all very useful designs in some places, but they do raise flood stage. So the question is, do we have room to raise the flood stage in the lower reaches, uh, or do we need to keep the flood flows at a lower elevation throughout the whole region. And these are things that as a stakeholder groups, you'll want to discuss and we'll want to figure out, okay, well, from this, how can we design, use this channel dimension to come up with a stable design based on a priority one, two, three, four, or another potential alternative for restoration. So in conclusion, uh, 5 SSR and bespoke mitigation. We've done a fair number of uh, channel design on urban channels as well as coastal channels. Um, and with the flashy environment, uh, the potential for changes in flows due to urbanization as well as changes of flows due to climate change and influences of more flashy hydrology, we strongly believe that a four stage urban channel design. Uh, that kind of emphasizes concepts of a priority two restoration is probably going to be one of the best options to start out with uh, from restoration. Doesn't mean it's the only option we do, but it's kind of the the primary go to option, if you will. So let's go to the next slide. Um, and with this, I don't we'll, see any uh, questions, but let me discuss it on. Uh, you know, in, in the interest of time, I, I think you could probably go to the next and show how this works. Dave, and then we could circle back with any overall yes, questions. That's, that's a good idea. We're going to run short on time. Great. So uh, we go through a multi criteria here now. To put this really quick here, essentially all we do is we lay out our goals, we create objectives from the goals, and we look at these different alternatives and say which one of these alternatives meets most of our objectives, and the one that meets most of the objectives is the most optimal. Uh, this relies on stakeholder involvement. It can't be done without stakeholders. You can go to the next slide. Um, the stakeholders are the drivers for the prioritization of which uh, type of restoration is done on each reach. Uh, so it's really important that people understand goals and objectives uh, to be able to look at ecological uplift. And we would spend a little bit more time, but I want to get to the example concept designs, and we have about 10 minutes left. So. Uh, do we want to let anybody ask a question if we have one or just move on to the concept designs? Yeah. Why don't we just field all the questions after the concept design presentation, Dave? So with the concept design, uh, this is kind of what we're looking at for the concept design. We're looking at a four stage channel and this is one of the existing cross sections out there. And you can see that we're not really cutting into the high terrace a whole lot. We're doing a little bit of grading on the bank where it's a vertical bank right now. And we're taking a little, little bit of cut material from the right bank and we're filling in the channel and raising up the invert, which will give us a little bit better hydrology. So we're slightly raising the channel, but not completely raising the channel. Uh, and we're creating a four stage channel. We start with a small inner berm channel, which is a light blue. We have the royal, the darker blue, which is a bankful channel, which is approximately as a 1.1 year recurrence interval. So it happens every year uh, on average. And then we have a flood terrace channel, which will happen closer to a 1.5 to 2 year channel. Uh, and then we have a 100 year discharge channel, which is really just graded and evaluated to make sure that we don't have uh, instabilities. And that is all going to both the uh, flood terrace channel and the 100 year channel are all going to be vegetated based on the existing vegetation that's out there at this time. Whereas the bankful channel uh, will be trying to use native vegetation as well, but we may have to bring in additional species. And then the inner berm channel, in a portion of the inner berm channel, we will have small areas where the channel will be uh, rocked or augmented with the natural substrate with 
imported material. Uh, so what this means is that with this four stage channel design, our smallest channel with on the base is about 10 foot. So that means where we place rock would be about halfway through the channel on the riffle features uh, for about a 10 to 12 foot wide swath opposed to the entire way along the channel for 76 foot wide as the Corps of Engineers had proposed in their design. Uh, so it's a lot less rock that you'll see. Most of this rock that is placed in this smaller channel will have vegetation and sediment that forms over top of it. So as vegetation continues to grow, you would see less of this rock. Uh, because we're not moving a lot of the floodplain, we're kind of working with the floodplain in places, we can harvest and transplant a lot of the vegetation that is repairing vegetation onto the bankful bench as well as a flood terrace bench, and we can transplant uh, upland vegetation to the 100 year discharge. So with this design, uh, even a lot of the vegetation that has to be uh, moved or removed because grading has to be done can be transplanted uh, and reused in a windrow type fashion. So if we go to the next, if you click one more time, this will give you an idea of what the design looked like for the Army Corps of Engineers design. So you can just see that much larger channel. And with the Army Corps of Engineers design, that whole 76 feet or 75 foot would be rocked in their design. Uh, and everything where it ties up to the existing ground would have to be excavated. And you could still reuse vegetation for transplants, but when you start having that much cut, uh, the transplants become difficult to manage with just the bulk movement and haul of material. So that's kind of one of the big uh, differences between the designs. Go ahead and hit hit the arrow button again. Uh, so this is kind of what this cross section will look like um, when we take away the graphic. Uh, so that gives you just a really big idea difference. Essentially, the width of your bankful channel in the Army Corps of Engineers design is still bigger than our flood terrace channel, the top of our flood terrace channel. So it's a, a significant difference. Uh, as you saw from the pictures that we shared in this presentation, we only see five foot in, in December of 2019 when we surveyed, we saw about five to 10 foot of flow in water. You can imagine over a 76 foot wide channel, you're gonna see even less flow in water because it's gonna be absorbed through the substrate uh, and it's gonna be a lot harder to define that low flow channel. Let's go to the next. So I'm gonna, go I'm gonna signpost something uh, here, just kind of connect um, this, many people in this group have been involved in the flow ecology special study and thinking about that. And, and out of that are coming some recommendations related to the depth and the velocity, the duration of flow. And, you know, fo focused for, for some focal species, a lot on the, um, the smaller flows, the, the spring recession, the, the summer base flow. And so, um, and and I, I see a comment from Mike also you know a couple related to low flows and 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 summer base flows. So is it fair to say this interberm channel could be adapted to, you know, to provide that sort of habitat um, if there were specific recommendations that came from Squirp and and company related to um, target species here, and it becomes a little more adaptable yeah, to yeah. to defining what we want that low flow channel to look like. Yeah, that right now the low flow channel that we proposed is essentially just the low flow channel that was geomorphically noticeable and observed in the field. So we looked at about 40% of the bankful cross-sectional area, and that's what we saw by surveying cross-sections in the field. If the low flow regime changes, uh, we have built low flow channels that had anywhere from about 20 to 70% of the bankful cross-sectional area incorporated into the inner berm channel. So, uh, we don't have a big concern of changing that. We may have to change a width to depth ratio or how wide that low flow is, and then change the bankful width to depth ratio or how wide the bankful channel is to accommodate those changes in low flow, but that's very feasible. I think it, I think in that way, this this design could be substantially more compatible from a concept level with, with the flow ecology study recommendations than what the, the course design would have been. I'll let you move on now, Dave. Thank you. All right, let's go to the next slide. Uh, the next slide talks about, um, you know, there are four stages and we have the inner berm stage, the bankful stage, a flood terrace stage, 
which is very common in urban environments, um, and then our 100-year discharge. It provides more aquatic habitat than what just one big trapezoidal channel would do, and it reconnects the channel to uh, floodplains that have been departed from. So there's a series of floodplains that Elysio Creek has been departed from based on changes in urbanization and just time. Uh, so this connects to some of those floodplains. It does not connect to the highest elevation floodplains. It could, if that's the goals and objectives of the of the uh, of the uh, group down the road and stakeholders. But right now, our thought is that we still want that flood protection, and it provides riparian and a wetland habitat improvements by raising up the stage and also creating these flat benches that we see the we see the benching and the terracing. Uh, but to create a flat bench is always beneficial from an agricultural standpoint because it allows water uh, to be captured on the back side of the benches and then you can have vegetation or crops that grow out from there. So essentially it's the same concept of terrace agriculture, just doing it inside of a channel. Uh, and then we see this migration of vegetation that will grow from that. Next slide. So vegetation area disturbance, our big idea is we want to limit the area of disturbance. Uh, there is a lot of areas that are unstable on Elysio Creek and causing high sediment supply rates um, and instability and concerns, but there's also areas that aren't doing too bad. Uh, every stream's gonna work towards stability in time. If you do nothing to it, every stream's gonna eventually get to uh, stability until there's another big disturbance that occurs. Uh, so, right now, Elysio Creek is on a trajectory towards stability. The only question is, do we want to wait until it achieves that? And while it moves towards there, is it going to be a lower elevation? Is it going to be not achieving the goals that the stakeholders have uh, by the time it finally gets to stability? Uh, and, it, and so that's really what we think about when it comes to natural channel design and restoration. We also want to think about the removal of invasive species. Uh, that are important with the revegetation, but then the transplants are going to be really key for this project and this natural channel design and this leapfrog approach or this windrow type approach. Uh, if we're grading a uh, channel, removing some floodplain material, for us to remove that and then take that transplant material and just put it right back in place at a lower elevation within the reach of a hydraulic excavator is a very feasible process that we do on many projects. Um, it means that the people uh, moving, equip, moving the transplants have to be knowledgeable or have to be directed uh, to be able to move the right species so we're not moving invasive species. Uh, we've had some places where we've trained our contractors and our equipment operators. We've had other places where we've had repairing biologists just be on site and constantly direct the equipment operators. Uh, and both of those work well. I prefer to have a repairing biologist, if possible, on site, uh, just because they can, they're going to have a lot better idea of the variations in species than you can train an equipment operator. Next slide. I'm going to do a time check in real quick. So we're at 1020, uh, which was the time we allocated for this, but I think we've got uh, more to show. And I think the uh, Attendees have some good questions. I think if, uh, we're okay with that. We're just going to continue with what we had. We'll see what we get to at the end. Uh, we have a couple questions from that last section, so I think maybe we should get those addressed before we move into this concept, unless uh, the rest of the group feels otherwise. Um, Jenna, do you want to hit those two questions quickly, and then we can sure concept? Okay. So. Um... Mike uh, Beenan, how will the plan comport with low flow requirements for the Alicia Estuary Restoration Project funded by the City of Laguna Beach and the California Coastal Conservancy? And my answer to that will be simple. I think it could, but I'm not familiar enough with what those requirements are, so I'm going to have to punt that to somebody else. I think you've already answered this to some extent, Dave, in the sense that you have a lot of flexibility to to design a channel that is resilient and and um, and compatible with a different flow regime. You know, so if the existing flow is for CFS round number, and you know that there is a you know 
long-term effort to get that down to something lower um, that a, a design could, you know, to, could tolerate that kind of low flow, um, flow, flow reduction um, from an overall watershed standpoint. I, th I think in a lot of respects, you've already answered that. Um, okay. All right, we have a question, I think, from Christine. Yep, from Christine Medek. Uh, for the proposed design, can you clarify where you would import rock from, i.e. local, National River Rock as opposed to riprap? Um, I don't know enough about the goals and objectives of the group uh, to know if it would be a natural river rock or if it would be a, a rip wrap. Uh, my, my general desire for this type of project is that we harvest uh, what we can locally and then we augment it with whatever source and the material is going to meet the right gradation. So uh, what that means that the armoring would have uh, natural rock look to it, even though the bones of it may be a uh, riprap uh, or natural river rock. I, I, I preferably like the look of river rock, but I don't always like the uh, environmental impact of river rock in areas. So we like to source river rock knowing that it's a beneficial source and opposed to a, a source and that degrades something else. So that's something that the stakeholder groups would probably have to look at in more detail. The rock to come from. Okay, I've got, got two more, Darren. Um, okay. From Rachel Waite, both invasive and non-invasive slash non-native species will be removed? Uh, we, uh, so the invasive species right now is our plan to have them removed and the non-native species that are not invasive uh i don't i don't know what the stakeholders group would what the stakeholders would prefer for that if they would be removed uh or not uh and then of course native species would be transplanted as much as possible um and that's but that the non-native non-invasive species uh the question from the stakeholders group would be, is that something that is desired to be removed or not? And I, I don't know how to answer that one. Jenna, I would just add quickly, uh, just a reminder to all, I mean, this is at best a concept plan. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of this um, you're gonna see in next steps, we're gonna you know evolve um, and as part of what we would advocate. And a lot of these questions may relate to later stages of the design and, um, and particularly with the import of the stakeholders. So I just remind folks on that. Thank you, George. It's a good reminder. Okay, and then we've got one more question from uh, Mike Beenan. Have sewer pipes been identified along Aliso Creek and will they be compromised requiring expensive relocation or armoring with new designs? Um, I'm gonna chime in real quick first here. Um, I know that um, SOQA is starting a project now that I believe is intended to be complete the end of near the end of this year um, to um, address some of the historic issues with the pipeline running along Aliso Creek. Um, so that's certainly something that will be considered in the design. Okay, I just want to remind everybody that we are recording this and we will post this online. So if we go past, uh, if you have a hard stop at 1030, um, know that uh, we will, you will be able to catch up on the, on the end of the meeting. Uh, go ahead, uh, David, I think we should move on. So we're going to talk about the concept designs and we just have two rough concept designs to lay out uh, for you. And this, this concept design, how we lay them out is really saying this is the dimension of the channel. This is how we could restore the channel based on priority one through four restoration. Uh, and this is what the alignment of the channel could look like after the restoration. So our first design was on reach uh, 5C. Um, and this is, this lays out the channel. We have a uh, green line, which is our flood line, our flood terrace. We have the existing channel, which is an orange here. Um, and then we end up having a limits of disturbance. Uh, and really what we laid out these concept designs for more than anything else is to get you an idea of what the channel may look like 
in plan form and what the the amount of area disturbance would be to be able to have this type of restoration. It's not saying that this is exactly how it would look. Uh, we're not that far along yet. Uh, this is just something like a five to 10% idea of, hey, this is where we may start to look at for restoration um, and, and give people an idea of where we could be going. Let's look at REACH 10 concept design next. And we'll talk about what that looks like uh, on the next slide here. So the next slide on REACH 10 here, it talks about the restoration um, and uh, with REACH 10, uh, we have a lot of infrastructure. So what we're showing here uh, in the next slide, we'd look at the profile, which is essentially the elevation of the stream uh, relative to uh, the elevation of areas around the stream. So what we sh show in profile is the proposed alignment of our stream compared to the existing elevation of the channel and the floodplain that the new alignment goes through. So what we're showing in this concept design profile uh, from LIDAR, we're showing a location where up near station, up near a, a station zero plus 10 or 500 feet, uh, from the start of reach 10, we're not really coming off of grade too much. We're about the same elevation of the of the existing channel. We may be adding some bend pools into the reach and then down below where we get to Liso Creek Road. So at Pacific Park Drive, we're about the same elevation at Liso Creek Road, we're about the same elevation. But then in between there will be grade and floodplain uh, and reconfiguring the floodplain as well as reconfiguring the channel. So it will allow us to have stability and also flood conveyance. Um, and one of the things that we're looking at in reach number 10, if we go to the next slide, is we look at the, the concept of what it looks like for, uh, in reach 10 right now, we have this large grade control structure that's out there. So looking at what it means to be able to uh, take out some of the existing grade control structures and work towards restoration. So on the next slide, uh, what this looks like, um, and you can go to slide number 38. Uh, so we, what it would look like in our design uh, is this four stage channel, uh, sorry, go back to slide 37. I wanted to go to the end of that one. I've told you to move too soon. There you go. So you have this four stage channel, which is what we laid out in the longitudinal profile, which the thaw wag or the deepest part of this channel uh, as designed is below the top of the invert of the structure. And we could still keep components of this structure in place, but then we would have a graded floodplain both upstream and downstream. So on the downstream side of the structure, there'd be a slight fill and on the upstream side of the structure would be a slight cut in and we could have revegetation that could occur on the floodplain on both sides of it. So we could still keep a structure in place to give us a floodplain sill, but it wouldn't be a noticeable structure anymore. So we would have components of it and we'd have to cut away uh, kind of a key, if you will, into this um, structure that could accommodate a four stage channel. So let's go on to slide 38. We zoomed into just the removal of this uh, uh, this dam or this grade control structure. And with the next phase of the design, we're looking at something like a five to 10% design right now to say that something could be feasible, it's out there. A lot of it's going to be dependent on exactly where the utilities are located related to the structure, uh, what type of utilities are underneath the structure, if there are utilities underneath the structure um, that would be impacted by uh, any kind of restoration. We have multiple profiles that we could design. We could say complete removal of the entire structure and essentially hit the grade at the bottom of the dam uh, and just tie in to that elevation. We could say partial removal where we're filling below the dam as we'd showed before, or we could say leave the whole dam in place and try to stabilize as much as possible, but then have to drop down the flows 
beyond the dam uh, for a different level of stability. So I think part of how we deal with utilities is related to whether we leave these uh, dam these this infrastructure in place or if we have partial removal. And where we have partial removal, if we're filling downstream and we have utilities that are compromised downstream, then as long as we're filling, we're not going to have any more compromise to those utilities. But if we're cutting upstream and those utilities, then we're going to have to make sure that the profile is such that it's not going to expose these utilities, or it's uh, valuable enough to re to change the location of the utilities if that is the case. Uh, but this is all stuff that there's a lot more design that goes into these uh, each one of these reaches later, and they have to be driven by the goals and objectives of the stakeholders, opposed to just my opinion of the goals and objectives of the stakeholders. Um, Next, go on to slide number 39. So, what we look at in concept design is, um, and we've provided this uh, as a KMZ file so it can be easily uh, given to people for review and evaluation and questions. Uh, they can just look at it in Google Earth, which is a free software for anybody to load. But what we're looking at is this idea of potential restoration. Uh, this is a priority two restoration. Uh, do stormwater outfalls, the big blue circle on the left side of the screen is basically where uh, there's a stormwater outfall and we could incorporate uh, best management practices into that. We didn't go to the feasibility of, hey, uh, could we do a best management practice here? Uh, uh, and what would the design flow rates would be? Uh, would people want to see it? We just literally said at 5%, to 10% is there space for something that we can incorporate and get some value. Uh, so that doesn't mean that we'd want to retrofit anything. It doesn't mean that we'd want to put in that BMP. It just means is there space. Um, and then we also included a couple idea of what, what some of the grade control structures and outside bank protection would look like from some of the streams that we've worked, worked on in different regions. Uh, the pictures that you see uh, on the far right side of this reach are from Colorado, North Carolina, Wyoming. So that's a uh, that's rough ideas of uh, concepts. So let's open it up to some questions here before we uh, move on, if that's okay. Yeah, perfect, David. Uh, Jenna, do you have any questions to bring forward? Yes, we have a question from Jennifer Blackhall. How soon will the recording be available and where will it be posted? Um, we will work to get that posted today and it will be posted uh, on our website. I will put the link in the chat. However, it is south ocirwm.org slash um, regional. Uh, I believe it is so I, but I will include it in, um, in the chat for, for everyone to go there. We will also, um, we can also send an email out to the whole, um, all the participants in the group today, um, and let them know where it is on the website. Um, so that anyone can, um, view it there. Um, Darren, I'm going to, I think you were going to chime in. We are, we're at time and we have, um, I think. We've had some good discussion. I want to make sure that we get the opportunity to um, talk about this in full. Um, so, do you? Would it be wise um, if you know Dave and George? Is would it be possible potentially for you to maybe join us at the, the beginning of the next meeting? Yeah, that would work for me. By all means, Jenna, you give us the date. We're more than happy. I think that'd be great to that give some people more time to digest what they saw today uh, with some more questions um, and not be rushed through that. Um, so then maybe Darren, um, we should um, go to kind of the, the meeting closeout and then Let's we can that. revisit this at the beginning of the next one. Sounds great. Let's go to, uh, I think we got two slides. Jenna, did we want to come back to raise question, or should we table raise question for oh, the next I'm sorry. meeting as we as we, we get into? Thanks, Eric. Um, let me let me just go back real quick here. Um, it's about time frame and next steps, and I think yeah, I think, I think it might be we'll worth have it. to. Oh, go ahead. 
Oh yeah, I, I think we could kind of definitely come back to that because there's plenty to talk about in next steps. I think as we you know think about taking this concept that's been presented and what would be the you know just the mechanics of when do we do more survey, when do we do more design, at what point do you figure out your grade control spacing and right. mitigation needs. And so there's a lot to talk about there, and I, I think it'd be great to hear Dave's perspective on that. But I, I don't want to rush him through that. Absolutely. But, yeah, if that's okay with you, Ray, what we will cover that um, at the next meeting because I think that's I, I agree. I think it's most pertinent with that part of the presentation. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Darren. Okay. Yeah, so the next slide was a conclusion slide that uh, David was going to present. Um, it just kind of summarized everything. We'll maybe put that up next slide. There you go. I don't know if there's anything real quick you wanted to say, David, or we could address this at the at the next meeting. I think this is a good summary. Yeah, of um, your efforts. I, I, I'll just, yeah, I'll emphasize it just for uh, half a minute here. Okay. Uh, the mini regional curve really showed us that there's a bank full channel and an inner berm channel that is significantly smaller than the two year calculated discharge by the Army Corps of Engineers, and we'll have a significant smaller area of disturbance. It will have less ecological disturbance. Uh, and it will allow for the reuse of a lot of the native vegetation on the stream. It also has a high potential for wetland restoration and revegetation. Um, and there's a high potential for uh, the uh, reduction of sediment load in downstream. And that's important uh, because sediment loading has an impairment uh, in the stream, uh, but also sediment loading does sometimes have benefits to downstream for beach um, nourishment as well. So those are things that stakeholders should be thinking about uh, as we continue on if this is a direction where people want. We'd only add very quickly, as you can see, um, you know, one of the things that I say, the functional and resilient ecosystem is a very broad term. Um, and you can begin to see, um, and the questions kind of relate to this is, if we're focused on sediment relative to stability and or for MS4 permitting, as an example, um, you may have a different approach than if you were looking at sediment for beach uh, replenishment. And so the goals, it comes back to my initial statement, which is sometimes the goals can be in conflict relative to what the design is going to be. And I think it's so important that this group dialed down a little bit on that issue. Uh, the other thing we threw out the wetland restoration and revegetation question because we know there's mitigation needs. And so the question that we have is there a bunch of, of, of really quantified metric scenarios that could come out of this project, depending again on, on those goals. The other point we didn't really hit on is this notion of phasing um, and, and the idea that um, it, you can phase these projects and we, we're happy to go through that um, in, the, in the call uh, in the next meeting, but I think it's important that people understand you don't have to do this all at once. And there's ways to integrate and approach the, these projects. Great. Thank you, George. Let's go to the, the next slide. I think we need to go back to the other PowerPoint. Yes. Thank you. There you go. Uh, so we had a series of uh, feedback questions that we were going to front with and had discussed, but since we don't have time to do that, I was going to suggest that perhaps we get these out to those that attended, or you know, I think it's probably best to those that attended. You can take a look at them, uh, revisit them, maybe formulate some other questions, get some answers, and then we can address these at the next meeting. I don't think we have time to get into any of these at this point, um, but they are important before we move forward that we have this discussion. So. Uh, that's my suggestion. Um, hopefully the group uh, feels that that's a, a good approach. Any feedback from anybody if that's how they'd like to. Okay, approach. I don't see any comments. So, I think I think that's that's what we'll do. We'll we'll send this out um, with uh, the meeting right up. Great, thank you. Okay, so I think we're gonna have to wrap things up. It's already 1041, I uh, apologize, but I think it was a good conversation. It was a great presentation. Thank you, David. Thank you, George.
Um, and I think there's going to be actually a lot more to talk about at the uh, next meeting. So we'll reformulate the agenda for that meeting, uh, making sure that we have plenty of time for this discussion. And I also think that this type of discussion will help us move forward with future projects because you can see the kind of detail and information and interest from the other members of the collaborative and the kinds of questions that you should and probably can get addressed by other members of the group. So thank you very much for attending and we will see you at the next meeting, which I believe is, I can't remember the actual date, the June, I want to say 25th or 26th, but I could be wrong on that. 24th. 24th, I was completely wrong, one day off. So June 24th. So look for information to be coming to you on that next meeting. Thank you all for attending. Thank you.